Now, I don't want the title of my talk to discourage you uh, from being an entrepreneur, but my way of thinking is that if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you ought to know what you're up against in terms of government. And sometimes it's very unusual and it's not obvious. So what I'm going to do today is tell you some stories of my adventures in real estate. Uh, back in the late 70s, uh, I, was, uh, I, was, I was working for the Uptown Company, as you've just heard. Uh, but I needed to find some family business that we could do because I had younger brothers and sisters who needed to have work as they went through school. And once they got out, maybe to stay employed. So I decided that we would go into the rehabilitation of low-income housing business. And I thought there was a market for this in Kalamazoo because it seemed like most landlords didn't want to deal with low-income housing. And it was in pretty poor shape. So I thought, ah, here's an opportunity. Well, I had a lot of adventures uh, doing that. And uh, I'm going to share some of them with you today because I had no idea that government was so bent on destroying entrepreneurship. Now, once again, I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to encourage you to be entrepreneurs, and we'll talk more about that later. But I think if I had known what I was getting into, I might have had a little bit different attitude, and I'd have some preparation, which I didn't have at the time. So hopefully what I'm going to say to do, uh, what I'm going to say today will allow you to have a little preparation. So one of the first things I did is um, bought a condemned building and started rehabilitating it. And of course, at a work site where you're doing massive rehabilitation, there's a lot of activity. Everybody in the neighborhood knows you're doing it. And so I wasn't surprised one day to have a gentleman come up to me and say, hey, you know, I live down the street just a few, uh, a few blocks, and I've noticed you have all this activity here, and I want to, I want to help out. You know, I'll work for $2 an hour. Well, this is Michigan in the late 70s. The minimum wage then was about $4 an hour. But I could see that this gentleman uh, was, I could see this gentleman had some, some issues. And he was, the address he gave me was down the road in a house that was there to help people who were, uh, maybe had some adjustments to make in living independently. And this gentleman's case, he probably was not um, of a, a very high IQ, but he wanted to help out. You know, he wanted to clean up the mess that we have generated in the area, you know, help with the trash and things like that. And, you know, I would have been delighted to do that. And he explained to me, you know, he can't get work. No one will hire him. And maybe if he did good work for me, I could either pay him a little more or I could give him a recommendation. And of course, I do write good recommendations. I had a lot of experience in that. I was very willing to do that. But my problem was, since he wanted something so far below the minimum wage, and, and that would have been about the rate that would have been reasonable for me to pay him, given what I expected his capacity was, I was a little nervous because I could just see him going back to his home and saying, yeah, I'm working for $2 an hour down the street. And I could see that I could be in very big trouble. So unfortunately, uh, I decided that I wouldn't do that. Uh, maybe now I would have a different attitude, but back then, I decided I couldn't risk the project by hiring someone like that. And it was very sad. He was very, very disappointed. Because he felt he could walk to work, he could do something productive, he could probably get a recommendation to get in the workforce. But this is the problem with minimum wage laws, is they keep those who are disadvantaged from getting that first job, a very important step, in order to, you know, continue on. Well, that was pretty sad. But in general, having an employee in a small business is sad because, of course, if you employ someone at an hourly wage, you also have to withhold Social Security, Medicare, income tax, and you have to do all the paperwork associated with that. So. For a small business person, it's much better to hire what we call contractors, people who work on their own and you don't have to take money out. But the IRS now has very strict rules about that. So it's not just something you can do, is label somebody a contractor. You have to follow certain guidelines. So it's important to know if you intend to have a business, 
it's better to have partners than employees. Now another thing that happened during this renovation is I realized I had to redo the electrical system in the house. When I started getting bids, what I realized is that the city buildings division would not give me a permit unless the person I chose was not only a licensed electrician, but one approved by the city. And you know what? There were only two of those. Those guys had a virtual monopoly. So I went to the other landlords and said, what, how do you manage with this? I mean, these guys are backed up. They're expensive. Uh, how do you do it? And they said, oh, well, there's a whole underground of licensed and unlicensed electricians. Uh, and what you do is you have them do all the work, and then you call these, uh, these two guys, one of these two guys out, and uh, he'll just hook up the final step to the box. <laughs> And you'll pay him almost as much as you just got done paying having the whole building rewired. But um, that's how it's done. And in fact, I later found out that's how it's done virtually everywhere, that there are a lot of electrician licensing laws. Now, incidentally, just a little factoid that really doesn't have much to do with this talk, but I thought might be of interest, is we have these laws because supposedly we're protecting people from accidental electrocution. Just a little fact to chew on. If you look across the states, what you find is that the states that have the most rigorous licensing requirements for electricians also have the most accidental electrocutions. <laughs> and the reason for that is that just what basically what I've talked about, as you limit the number of electricians by licensing laws, rigorous licensing laws, the number of people who make it through the program are less. They can charge more. So more people try to do the repair themselves or don't even do it. And that's what puts people in trouble. So just a little aside. Now I've talked to you about some of the things I looked, uh, I, I learned about how the government impacts on entrepreneurs trying to hire workers. Now the particular business that I was in, I also ended up with tenants. And that also was a whole other story. So I had this one tenant who had been a great tenant, and unfortunately her son had a strange form of leukemia. So what she had to do, because she didn't have health insurance, is she had found out that there was a, a group in Tennessee who would treat her child for free. So she left Michigan for a couple months and went down to Tennessee had her son treated, it was effective, it was great. She came back and said, you know what, Mary, I went to the welfare people today because I figured, I know I owe you six weeks back rent, and I, I figured that they would help me out with it. You know, that was my plan. But you know what they told me? They told me that they wouldn't pay those six months back rent, but if you evicted me, they would give me a new damage deposit the first month's rent somewhere else. How wasteful is that? I mean, I would have to take her to court. There would be court costs. Then she'd have to move. She said, I don't want to do that. Can I pay you $10 a month until this thing is paid off? That's all I can afford, but I can't afford that. So I said, I'm happy to do that, but there's just one condition. You cannot tell anyone else about this. Because if you do, if you tell your neighboring tenant about it, I have to take them to court for their back rent. They're going to have it thrown out of court because I can't discriminate. I can't treat one tenant different than the other. So if you tell somebody and they tell the judge, I'm going to have to give them the exact same deal I gave you, which means no late charge and $10 a month. And I'm not willing to do that for everybody. So once again, you know, government made it difficult for me to help someone out. And if I, you know, a, another landlord might have been discouraged by this and decided not to do it. Now this lady, well she, she just had problems one after another with the government. She decided to do daycare in her home. You know, her child of course was sick a lot of the time. He was home a lot. And this was a 28-unit apartment complex, so there were other tenants that had to go to work and leave their children. So they left them with her. Now, I was happy with that. The tenants were happy with that. But you know, the city buildings division wasn't happy with that. 
they harassed this lady and told her that she didn't have a business permit to do that and that to get a business permit the apartment would have to be inspected almost for certainly the ceilings weren't high enough the whole apartment would have to be remodeled uh, and uh, and so she would have to basically go out of business and she came to me and said what am I going to do I said oh just keep on doing it I don't care it's not creating a problem for me so of course then the city buildings division contacted me and said evict her please she's breaking the law well I refused to do that but the city officials kept hounding her and she kept saying to him well, what am I supposed to do I mean I've got to earn my rent somehow they said, that's what welfare is for. <laughs> <laughs> and they kept hounding her, and eventually, you know, eventually she succumbed. You know, it's one thing for those of us who are steeped in the principles of liberty and, and feel fervently about them and are willing to kind of take the next step, but a lot of these people are just on the edge, and they, you know, they can't handle another fight. It's just too stressful. And I had another lady who sewed curtains in her apartment. And what she did is she'd go out to the neighboring businesses, she'd measure their windows, she'd sew her curtains in the apartment, and then she'd bring the curtains back to the business, right? No extra traffic, no problems, uh, except for the city buildings division. Uh, they told her she was running a business and she needed an expensive permit, and hey, the apartments weren't zoned commercial for the uh, permit. So she couldn't get one. Well, the same story, basically. They kept hounding her. And eventually, she too went on welfare. And you know, this welfare, at least in Michigan at the time I was renting, was actually very nefarious. Here we have the government officials encouraging women who are supporting themselves to go on welfare. But the whole system is rigged in that way. I would have young women come to me, uh, they would be 15, 16, the high school students basically, they'd say, I'm going to have my baby in three months, and when I do that, the government will give me a check every month for my rent. So would you rent me an apartment? And for these ladies, it was almost a rite of passage to uh, establish their own household by having the child. Now, if they had had to pay for that child themselves, they probably wouldn't have done that. but And they didn't know any better at 15 or 16. So what they would do is they would have that baby, then they would realize, mm, this isn't working out. It costs a lot more money to take care of a baby than they're giving me on welfare. So I'll have the second baby and I'll get more. And that wasn't quite enough either. So I'll have the third baby and get more. And of course in Michigan at that time, the welfare, extra welfare money stopped at three babies. So here they are with three babies. They're barely 21 yet. And they go, oh, I'm going to be poor all my life if I try to stay on welfare. I need to get a job. But you know, they dropped out of school to have the baby. So they don't have even usually their high school diploma. And they have three children. Who's going to take care of the children while they're out working? Unless they had a relative that would do that, they were really stuck. And then, when they did that, they found out there was no transition from welfare to that first entry-level job until they got the promotion. What happened is the <coughs> medical benefits ran out. You know, they didn't give them to them anymore once they got a job. And yet the new job they had, since it was entry-level, wasn't enough to have medical benefits usually. So they were actually making less working than they had been on welfare, if you take the total package. So many of them simply decided that it wasn't worth it. And I, I can't blame them in a way. The system was rigged to encourage them to make bad decisions in high school. And then, you know, once they woke up and recognized what they had done, the system was set up to defeat them as they tried to get out of it and say they were, they were in the poverty trap forever. And in Michigan, if the father of their child lived with them, they couldn't get welfare. So not only did the welfare encourage these women to make bad decisions, but it didn't even allow them to have the father of their children living with them in order for them you know, to get this uh, established household. 
And it really was bad for the men, too, because then they had no connection with their children. They felt kind of useless. I mean, back then it was still the breadwinner was the man. And of course, in, in these situations, it was all turned around. It was, it was a very bad situation. And many of these uh, ladies, of course, were, were people of color. So, you know, it really destroyed the minority families in the Michigan area. And I assume it happened in other states, too. I just don't know the, you know, the intimate uh, details of the other states. I can only talk <coughs> from experience from Michigan. Okay, so now you have an idea of how the government, when you're an entrepreneur, really makes it difficult for you to hire workers. And in the case of landlord-tenant relations, it really changes the whole nature of the landlord-tenant relation. And you can see how the labor laws and the licensing laws actually put productive people out of work and create poverty. In fact, uh, as many of you know, if you've heard me speak before, you know that I believe that most poverty today is caused by government. And I'm including the third world in that. The third world is poor because their governments are much more aggressive than ours is, if you can believe that. <laughs> no, actually, it is quite, quite bad. There was a Stossel program at one time where he tried to start a business in New York City. It took him a few weeks, a couple weeks. He tried to do it in Hong Kong. It took him a day. He tried to do it in India. It was going to take five years with no guarantee that he'd ever get his permit. Now, this is why Hong Kong has a very high per capita income, why we're kind of going in the wrong direction, <laughs> and why India is so bad off. This is the same thing playing out at the national level. Okay, so I've talked about workers. I've talked about tenants. Now I want to talk about the buildings themselves and the attitude of the city of Kalamazoo. You see, when I got into this business, I didn't know something very important. I didn't know there was a plan for the city. <laughs> and this plan was to get rid of all the low-income people by condemning all their housing <laughs> and bulldozing it. <laughs> so when I entered the market and tried to buy my first building, they actually tried to stop me. They said, this building's going to the wrecking ball in two weeks. I said, yeah, but I'm going to fix it up, and it's going to be great. No, we don't want you doing that. Well, it took me a while to understand that. But I, I remark on that because you'll understand my other comments better when you understand the plan. Not understanding the plan in my early years, of course, I was very confused. So what would happen is when you bought a condemned building, well, first of all, let's talk about how they condemn buildings. The city inspectors would go to the various buildings, and if they didn't think they were in good repair, they would condemn them. Now, the average person would think, oh, well, that means it's unsafe. You know, the electrical is, is frying, the, you know, there's, uh, there's massive rat infestation or something like that. But actually, the city, the city inspectors could condemn your house or your apartment building for really almost any violation, and that includes peeling paint. So I would go and look at some of these buildings that have been condemned, and I have the list in front of me, and I'm going, wow, the biggest defense is peeling paint? I can take care of that. But of course, what I didn't realize at the time is that, of course, there was a plan. All right, so the problem with the condemnation for the landlord is if an inspector comes in and condemns your building, a number of things happen. First of all, they tell your tenants not to pay rent anymore. The building is condemned, but you can't put them out on the street. No, you have to take them to court still. Now, that's a process. It's expensive. And what the tenants figured out is that if you were, in the meantime, trying to upgrade the building and they destroyed your, um, the things that you did, then the building would be condemned again and they could stay rent-free even longer. So, you know, this was a little game that some of them played. Anyhow, once the, the, the plan, of course, was once the building was condemned and the tenants weren't paying rent and the landlord was having a hard time evicting them, 
the landlord would throw up their hands and say, this isn't working, you know, it's a drain on me, I'm not going to make my mortgage payments anymore, I'm just going to quit. And of course, because that happened so often, none of the banks in the area would lend on the rental property. So most people in that area, when they sold the building, sold it on what we call land contract, or here we would call a deed of trust. In other words, the landlord didn't get their I'm sorry, the owner did not, when the seller, let me go back, when the purchaser came, the purchaser didn't come with a bank loan to pay off the owner. What he did is he said, okay, I'll pay you so much every month. So you can imagine when the people who bought these buildings and were paying the owner every month found out that they couldn't get rent from their tenants and they were in trouble, uh, that the, land, the um, own, old owner had to take back the building. And usually if they sold it, they sold it because they were too old to take care of it or, or something else. They didn't want to spend more time on it. So here they get this condemned building back. They have to fix it up in order to get the condemnation off so they can sell it again. But the problem is these are all old buildings, right? And the old buildings, um, of course, have a lot of things grandfathered in. So once your building is condemned, those no longer grandfather clauses no longer count. Now you have to bring it up as if it were a new building. The electrical codes, the plumbing codes. Everything. So it's very discouraging. It's a huge, huge cost. Anyhow, as you can see, there were a lot of problems for people who wanted to be entrepreneurial and fix up real estate in the Kalamazoo area. And the city inspectors didn't also always agree either. I had one building where I fixed up the fire escape. The inspector came out and said, oh, this isn't going to do. You know, I know that the person under me told you that it was OK to fix it up this way, but it isn't. You'll have to redo it. And I ended up redoing that fire escape three times. It's very expensive. So, you know, they have full authority and the courts <coughs> back them. So it's very, very difficult. All right. I've told you enough bad news. <laughs> I'm telling you this because there are hidden things that it's actually kind of hard to find out when you're starting out in business. Thankfully, Steve Jobs started out in a business that wasn't so heavily regulated. <laughs> <laughs> But if you go out and want to become an entrepreneur, be aware. Now, some good news. Our fellow libertarians are changing the landscape on this. I've put up on the uh, boards the Institute for Justice, IJ.org. After I left the business in Kalamazoo, because at some point I threw up my hands and said, you know, I can handle the renovation, I can handle the tenants, I can handle the evictions, but I can't handle the city buildings division anymore. <laughs> uh, Institute for Justice came in and actually took action against the city of Kalamazoo's building division and a number of other Midwestern states. And that's because what they were doing is they were, the inspectors would come and they would tell, they would tell the tenants that they had the right to come in and inspect even if the tenant didn't want them, uh, even without a search warrant, even if the tenant wasn't there. And IJ just decided this was way, way over the top. The tenants were angry because they felt that their home was their castle, even if they were renting it. And so uh, they were taken to court, uh, several <coughs> buildings divisions by the Institute for Justice, and justice prevailed <laughs> for a change. <laughs> folks, you ought to get to know them. They actually have a chapter in Austin. And what they do is they take on cases, mostly minority cases, where the government is stopping <coughs> entrepreneurs, for example, from starting their own taxi cabs because they've limited the number of licenses, or they have to have a hearing where all the competitors get to say how bad of an idea it is for somebody else to come in. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. And, and it's really interesting to read their cases. They've been to the Supreme Court. They were the, they were the people who took eminent domain to the Supreme Court. They were the ones who were fighting for our rights. Uh, they did lose at the uh, Supreme Court level. But based on their actions, um, there have been 
anti-eminent domain laws now passed in many, many states. So a good group. Um, I don't get anything for promoting them. I'm a donor. <laughs> I recommend that you get to know them because if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you might need them someday. <laughs> so I didn't want to leave you without resources because being an entrepreneur really does have its benefits. Um, I was a research scientist. That's one of the few professions where you almost have to be an employee. Uh, but for many, many things that you're going to want to do, it's much more lucrative and empowering to be your own boss. So I don't want to discourage you by what I've told you today. I just want to tell you that there are some things you want to be prepared for. And I hope that I've been able to give you some of that preparation. My time is up, so I'm going to, I, I want to have to take questions. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and stop at this point and thank you for uh, listening to my stories. Back. Yes, you're going to Wait, one second. Yes. I just had a quick question. What was the name of the group, uh, the legal action group that helps entrepreneurs? I missed the name of it. Institute for Justice. And this is their uh, website okay. up here. Okay. Institute for Justice, IJ.org. Uh, yes, in the back. How do you feel about um, property tax? I mean, you know, not only do you have to pay property tax, but you got to pay you know, the, the, um, the interest on your mortgage. I mean, you've got to make at least um, a decent return on your investment before you can actually break even. That's right. Well, property taxes were very high in Kalamazoo at the time I was doing this. It was, I think it might have been the second largest, after mortgage, the second largest bill. And so you pass these costs on to your tenants. You have to. And, and what most people don't know is a lot of the low-income tenants, especially, that are relegated to inner-city type public schools, um, you know, are paying these high property taxes through the rent for these crummy schools because that's mostly where property tax goes. So, of course, like most libertarians, I think taxation is theft at any level. <laughs> and, um, and so, and I, I think it's especially onerous for the poor. I think this is something that isn't realized since the poor generally are renters. Yes, I thought it, yes, yes, go ahead. Yes. Um, just to clarify, um, were you in rental properties, construction, what were you doing? Oh, I was in rental properties, but what happened is sometimes these condemned buildings needed like major fix-up. So I was the general contractor as well. Okay, and um, a follow-up question to that. Um, how many licenses did you have to have in order to go into that? <laughs> ah, well, generally what happened in our area is you would hire a licensed contractor to pull the permits. Um, and again, depending on the situation, uh, this person might or might not hire labor that was licensed or not. Depended on what uh, the situation was. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. I have a question. Um, you, you, you talked a lot about the Institute for Justice, mm -hmm. and we have a chapter here in Austin. Yes. And I'm wondering, what did it take to get them to actually get interested in a case? Because I know a couple of people who have had, who have had civil rights type cases one of them involving a business and the other one involving a, uh, an occupational licensing issue uh, because Texas, of course, has 29 occupational licensing agencies run by the state, which are completely unnecessary. Um, well, how do you get the, uh, the, neither of them to get the IFJ to, to get really interested in what they were doing. Um, how, how do you get their attention? Well, that's a good question, and I'm not sure I can answer that uh, fully. I suspect they do pick their cases carefully. Obviously, they can't take on everybody. And I, I've noticed that the people they tend to take are, if they can, they try to take cases where the person is obviously a minority or in a disadvantaged position. That way, when they go to the court, obviously, uh, what they're showing <coughs> is that these rules are hurting the very people they're supposedly intended to help. I don't know what other criteria they use, but. I, I think you know a phone call to them would be very worthwhile. Just ask them. You know, how do you pick your cases so we know? I think that would be good. Uh, oh yes. Uh, Joe McNulty, uh, University of North Texas. Um, some cities will sometimes uh, have very strict building codes in order to try to maintain like the historical uh, integrity of a city. I know Boston does that a lot. And, 
What, like, what do you say to that argument uh, where people say, well, you know, we kind of want this city to kind of maintain its own, like, history and stuff, and so we kind of want the buildings to kind of fit in with that. Um, what do you say to people that make that argument? Well, what happens in, in real life, because we had some of that in Kalamazoo, is that these buildings became incredibly expensive. In other words, you know, you had to put so much extra into the building to maintain its historical character, sometimes even by getting hardware for doors and things that were, you know, from salvage somewhere. And it was very pricey. So these, you know, basically what this does is it increases the price of the building so much that no one can afford to rent it or buy it. That's what happened in Kalamazoo. And, you know, that's a nice thing, but who's paying for it? <laughs> If you want a historical section, uh, then the proper thing to do in my way of thinking is for a group of people to get together, buy the historical section, and maintain it the way they want, not force everybody else to do it, you know, because that's what you're really doing. And the bad thing about it, the, you know, the thing I think that, that I have a problem with in this area is when you buy the historical building, you don't always know what all the restrictions are. They can change. A meeting of the zoning committee or something like that can overnight change the value of your building. Uh, you know, if they decide to put it in the historical district, ah, you know, now you've got some problems. If they decide to zone it differently, uh, they can zone it so you can't rent it or something. And actually, we have this happen in Kalamazoo, too. I've had a couple bought something and renovated it, and then the zoning board decided it wasn't going to be rentable anymore. And the couple was there saying, you know, we put all this money into it. And, you know, they, they really don't care. It's, it's very sad. Yes, John. This doesn't only apply to business activities. It also applies to charity. Some of you may remember down the street, uh, we used to uh, give free food to homeless people under 7th Street Bridge or overpass. They don't do that anymore. The city came down on us, forbidding us to free feed the homeless. That's crazy. It's and crazy. have you ever wondered what restaurants and supermarkets do with all their food that they can't sell? Well, they throw it away, right. But why don't they just donate it to the hungry and the homeless? Because they are not allowed to. So I, I, I'll just make one comment. I used to, when I was a little kid, my family business was renovating buildings and reselling them. At that time, we didn't have the problem with inspectors that we do today. But what we used to, to the little, limited extent we did, uh, my mother and I and our few friends would do all the electrical, the wiring, and everything else. And when it came time to get the permit, it was, oh, we did all of this. Plumbing and wiring is original with the building. All we did is put on a little paint. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you have to do. <laughs> yes, huh? Are there a map or putting together an ID during the lobby where you would create uh, enterprise zones? Mm -hmm. And the enterprise zones will waive the minimum wage requirement. So anyone within these zones, wherever they are, could get the end uh, or wouldn't have to be limited to uh, minimum wage. However, in conjunction, the incentivized businesses would come with an incentive. In other words, they would be getting, right now, as it's presented, um, sales tax back. And I'm wondering if you've heard that. If not, I'm wondering how, how we balance corporate welfare with, you know, sometimes giving more rights than minimum Well, that's a good question. You know, what, what rules do you want in an enterprise zone? Um, I don't, I'm not aware of the plan you're talking about, but I know that in Costa Rica, they were actually trying to do a project, of the Limon project. And they were trying to create the zone because the libertarians there figured that if they created the zone and they got government to go along with it, it would be so prosperous that government would say, ah, oh, yeah, we could make the whole country like this and, and, you know, do that. So I think in general, it's a good idea to try it. Um, again, the trade-offs that they make could be, could actually kill it if they don't do it right. But I, I'm not familiar with that one, so I can't comment. We have a 
occurred to you? Yeah, I, on the notion of historical districts and whatnot, one of the things you can also do are deed restrictions. And in Portland, Oregon, there is a couple of blocks where people are notorious. I mean, their streets get jammed around Christmas time because everybody decorates their homes. I mean, it's just a menagerie of lights. And in those homes, when you buy one, it says that you will, at Christmas time, decorate your home. <laughs> Oh, Kurt was with me in Kalamazoo for a while, so he probably knows some of these stories too. <laughs> yes. Um, when I was a child, I used to live in like the New York area, and we lived in an apartment, me, my mom, and my brother. And like every once in a while, my mom would like make me clean up, and she just would say, "The inspector is coming. You need to clean up." <laughs> <laughs> and like they made it like feel like this inspector had some high, mighty power that. He could just kick you out if you, like, if you kept your house a mess, and that's, or just had, and like, looking back on it now, like how you were saying, like, those guys could just, like, for little things, like, could kick you out of the house, or say you're evicted, or go to your landlord and say that, that's kind of messed up. <laughs> well, yeah, so far the building inspectors uh, weren't able to actually kick out the tenants themselves, but might be different in New York. I understand they're really <laughs> aggressive there, so, yes. Um, I just have another local example. Anybody from Oklahoma, anybody driven through Oklahoma, seen signs for Indian City? You can't miss it. Thank you very much. Um, and so I drive by, I've been there a few years ago, so I went by recently, it's always closed, and so I finally asked around, they said, oh, it was owned by a local tribe. It's, it's corny, it's not as corny as it sounds, it's actually very educational. And, um, it was, it was, they sold it to some local businessmen, but all the codes, all the electric codes, all the building codes were grandfathered in. And so they had to close it down for like a year or two. And the, and the unintended consequence was all the local hotels, all the local wineries, all the local restaurants, they were suffering. Because it was a big tourist attraction that brought tourists to the middle of Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, there's always those unintended consequences. Yes. Yeah, could you comment for a minute on uh, risk? And on uh, barriers to entry, what you experienced uh, in, in terms of these government uh, involvement in your choice to enter or not enter a project? You mean in buildings? Yes, if you were choosing to, to uh, pick a building or we're not going to do that one, mm -hmm. how did you factor for risk and for barriers to entry? Well, because I hadn't realized what was going on, I didn't factor for this risk. <laughs> and so I got some pretty nasty surprises, uh, as you can probably imagine. But I, I tend to be fairly uh, persistent, so I kept on for many years. I did not have, uh, you know, except for the historical buildings, which re represented inviting regulation after regulation, uh, we didn't have any stratification in that manner. So I didn't have a problem there. However, if anyone is going into real estate um, and, and wants to do rental real estate, which by the way, I should mention that more millionaires are made in this country from real estate than anything else. And that's still true today. So it is something to think about. If you're going into it, um, I would say it is true, location, location, location. <laughs> One of the things I did in, in going into low-income housing, because I thought it would be a, a great market, a great thing to do, because no one else was in it, and I can see why after being in it, but <laughs> um, I, would, I would suggest that that's not the place to start. I would suggest, you know, middle income is, is a, better, a better first try for somebody who's, who's going to be doing this. So I would avoid low-income housing. And, go, and avoid the high end too, because you know that's usually you can't make enough money to pay your mortgage and stuff from the rent. So you need to have something in between. Uh, so I would say the middle range, and of course you need more per unit when you have multiple units. In most places, though, if you get over four units, then you're considered a commercial operation as opposed to a residential. So that's something to check. And you know, basically, I would go to your landlord's association if you're thinking about doing this and listen to everything they have to say. That's, if I had to do it over, that's what I would have done first. <laughs> yes? You mentioned that there was a gray market of electricians that emerged due to the regulations. Mm -hmm. What do you feel about 
that seems to be something we can anticipate when government acts the way that they do. Is that an area that you encourage us to enter? And how do we license electricians to treat the legality of what that, the unlicensed? Because like, technically what they were doing was not frowned upon because if it was, it would have changed. Like if you challenged the fact that they were signing off on their work, well, then they would have just hired electricians that would do it the, by the book, and that wouldn't have worked at all. So. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a it's a very difficult uh, position to be in. It's not unlike being an illegal immigrant uh, if you're an unlicensed uh, service provider. You know, anytime somebody gets angry at you, they can they can report you, and you can have bad consequences. So, you know, that's the difficult part of that. I think most of the licensed electricians that were signing off on work actually knew and had worked with before <laughs> these unlicensed electricians. I mean, this was this was so established, I, I kind of got the feeling that the city buildings division was well aware of what was going on. I mean, this was, you know, this was the way it was done. Uh, so I, I don't know what to say. I mean, again, every market is different. So if you're considering something like that, obviously you just need to, you know, see if it's right for you. I wouldn't. I couldn't recommend or not recommend it, except to point out that technically you're breaking the law, so you need to be prepared for consequences. You know, if you're going to take that on. Who's not breaking the law? Yeah. Who's not? That's. I yes, and I. I agree. It's very hard not to break the law. Every one of us who files or doesn't file income tax probably breaks the law because even the accounting firms, you know, they have this, Money Magazine used to have this contest every year, for those of you who don't know this interesting little factoid, and they give 30 high-end accounting firms a tax return to do. None of them ever got it right by the IRS. The IRS said, no, nobody got it right. Now, if the accounting firms can't get it right, when you fill out your tax form, what's the probability that you have done it right? <laughs> I mean, I have a PhD in biophysics, and I can tell you, uh, I'm like, ah! <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it is. So we're all breaking the law probably in some way, and maybe that's intended. I have one minute. I would like to, if you don't mind, make a little announcement. Um, I wanted to tell you, uh, my website, I was going to put my website up here, but it seems to be down right now. I'll fix that as soon as I get home. I'm not sure what happened. But the reason I wanted to share my website with you is that you need some free material on this kind of stuff at my website. So my website is ruart.com, www.ruart.com, just like my name, which is in the program. And there you can get the 1992 version of my book, Healing Our World, as a free download. I have brought some of the 2003 edition with me for sale here at the event. And I've also bought, brought the last, literally the last copies of Short Answers to the Tough Questions. Uh, it will be coming out again next year uh, in a, an expanded edition. So this is the last chance to get these first edition copies. I didn't bring very many of them. I do have some more out in the car if somebody really wants them. But I did want you to know that you can also get the short answers. When you go to my website, uh, there's a link that takes you to the advocates.org. That's T H E A D V O. Help me out here. I can't see it in my head. Yeah, A D O V A C T E S dot org, um, where I do a web zine with these short answers to the tough questions. And there's usually some type of um, page that you can go to there, which has like an archive of all my old answers. So if you want to <coughs> free stuff, that's a way to do it. If you like having a book, I've got those too. But I just wanted to thank you again for inviting me. I hope that what I shared was useful to you. And uh, I hope to come again and share something else different. Thanks.